Welcome to the Hey Universe. It is officially fall now, so you know it's time for my annual Hello Fall video. This seasonal episode will be covering what I've been able to harvest so far this year and what harvests are still yet to come. If you'd like to see the varieties of seeds I planted this year as well as some updates, I'll have the cards right here for you to check out my Hello Spring 2024 video and the 2024 interim check-in video. Any non-flower plants, seeds, or tubers that you don't see an update on in this video, you can probably assume it sadly didn't make it. Anyway, let's talk about this Kentucky Wonder Pole Bean. They are super easy to grow, and even now, the plant is persisting and starting to give me another round of beans. I thoroughly enjoy the fresh taste that they have, and my favorite way to eat them is just to lightly cook them in oil on a frying pan and then munch away. I didn't think there would be a difference to store-bought beans, and it could be, of course, grower bias, but I'm pretty sure homegrown beans taste better. The ease of caring for this bean has encouraged me to try growing different types of beans next year. The ones on the top of my list are edamame, garbanzo or chickpeas, and the Greek gigante bean. The footage I've captured here is from my exciting first harvest of beans. At the time, there were some baby ones growing in, and some that I let get a little too bumpy. I've read and heard that you want to harvest beans before they get too bumpy because they'll taste better that way. Honestly, I can't tell the difference. They were all yummy to me. Some things I've learned about growing beans are that they don't want to get hit with our full sun here, and my plants probably could have used more fertilizer. But. Despite being a newbie, I'd say the beans are a rewarding crop to grow. Like I said, the plant is still growing and producing a few beans, but I should probably clean up the dead leaves and vines soon. Let's talk about the peppers. I had a bunch of no ID ones that were very old seeds. Some of them grew, some of them didn't, and so far on the ones that's grown, I've seen no signs of an actual pepper. On the other hand, the hot Korean chili pepper has produced many peppers, and the hot lemon pepper is just starting to do the same. This is a green okra that struggled to grow from seed and finally gave me one very nice okra pod. I let it dry on the plant so that I can have seeds for next year. The various different types of cucumbers we planted also took off quite spectacularly, but we didn't get as much rainfall this year and it was difficult to maintain moisture in this particular garden bed. We got a couple tasty cucumbers, but over time the cucumbers became super bitter and inedible due to inconsistent watering. This is the best and biggest one I was able to harvest this year. After I removed all the plants, I planted a loofah in this box. As the loofah grew, I noticed two seedlings pop up and realized they were late bloomer cucumbers. I decided to experiment with them by growing them in a plastic container that would hold onto water better. The cucumbers are just starting to form now and I'll be able to see in a few weeks if they taste good or not. If they turn out well, I'll probably opt to grow cucumbers in plastic pots from now on because it's easier to maintain. 
So far, the leaves look much healthier and happier, which means I'm probably on the right track. This year was a fantastic bell pepper year for us. If you're good at growing nice plump bell peppers, you're probably wondering what on earth I'm talking about because mine look shriveled. But the fact that we got any mostly normal sized bell peppers to harvest is a huge step in progress for us. In the past few years of trying with bell peppers, we had not been successful at all. But this year, I made sure to stay on top of watering and I fertilized quite a bit. Even then, the shape of these were not up to par with market level bell peppers, but they still tasted yummy and had a nice crunch to them. One of the branches broke during the growing process, so I had to eat them before they were able to fully change color to yellow. But even so, they had plenty of refreshing flavor. My mom did mention that some of them were a bit bitter, which could have been due to our sudden heat wave, so this is another plant that I'll be repotting into a plastic pot for next year. I had it growing in a canvas pot, which is much more breathable than plastic, but doesn't hold on to water as long. My plan is to save the seeds from these bell peppers and grow a few more plants. Now this next harvest came as a huge surprise. For a lot of the seeds this year, if they didn't germinate after a month or two, I figured it wouldn't grow at all and use the soil for other plants. Fortunately or unfortunately, sometimes the seeds just decide to germinate really late and I have surprise mystery veggies popping up in pots they're not supposed to be in. This plant is one of those instances. At first, looking at the shape, I thought and hoped it was eggplant but it stayed small and started changing to orange and I realized that one of the yellow pear tomato seeds actually survived. I initially had it in the small pot but repotted it into something larger where it's currently growing happily. There are several more flowers and fruit growing in so I'm excited to harvest more than just two. I shared them with my mom and we both loved it. I left them on a little too long because I had procrastinated filming but regardless this variety packs a bunch of flavor. I also think the shape of these is really cute. Here's a sad clip of how the onions and or garlic grew. There's honestly not much to say and the resulting harvest says it all. We'll come back to the Murasaki sweet potato a little later in the video, so let's focus on the potatoes first. I planted Adirondack blue potatoes and several No ID and Dutch baby potatoes in this raised bed. I waited until all the plants died back and then went into harvest. I also harvested the huckleberry gold potatoes that I had growing in this canvas pot. 
For all the potatoes this year, I had difficulty maintaining water, so I'll be changing my strategies for next year. I also didn't fertilize much, so that's something I'll have to do differently too. Because of all those factors, I decided to cut my losses and harvest the huckleberry golds early before all the plants died back. These are the Adirondack blues I managed to get. These are the huckleberry gold seed potatoes that still had some life in them and the huckleberry gold harvest. Though it was a humble amount, it was still enough to enjoy a few nice breakfasts. Let me just warn you right now that you may develop some frustration while watching me attempt to gut this first potato. In fact, I'm frustrated watching this back. I don't usually do much cooking, though I'm practicing more these days, and it clearly shows. I'm really not sure why I didn't just cut each half separately instead of unsteadily holding them together like this. I'll blame it on the fact that it was early in the morning. Don't worry though, I do realize that this is inefficient and I change it out for the rest of the potatoes. My mom and I decided to cook them country potato style to eat with pancakes, bacon, and eggs. I mixed the Adirondack blues and the huckleberry golds together to give our eyes some visual interest. I absolutely love them, especially the huckleberry gold. It has an extra chewy texture that I quite enjoyed. My mom liked them both too, but she preferred the Adirondack blue because it wasn't as chewy. Ah, the quintessential American breakfast. I'm craving it again now, but I'll have to wait until next season. I did save some of the potatoes to use as seed potatoes next year, so let's look forward to 2025's harvest. Every year, we go perilla, or as we call it, genni. The leaves are often used in Asian cooking, and the way my family uses it the most is either to make wraps with rice and meat, or turn it into a spicy side dish. It is part of the mint family, so it has a strong, sharp flavor to it, and many people don't like it because of that. But it's a staple for our household, and it grows really well for us here. All I want is lots and lots of water, and it's good to go. The size of the plant here is after a good amount of trimming, so you can get a grasp of how vigorous this plant is. It usually dies back after flowering and I just shake the seeds back into the pot. We wait until springtime and voila, the cycle starts again. Another surprising success. The original set of basil seeds I planted in my Hello Spring video didn't make it. But at some point in one of my plant orders this year, the seller sent some freebie Genovese basil seeds and this plant is one of those. The only one, I might add. I haven't used it yet in cooking, but I like to smell it every time I'm outside. Okay, and we'll wrap it up with some harvests that are yet to come. As promised, we've come back to the Murasaki sweet potato. 
Since I removed the other potatoes, these two plants have full reign of this raised bed. Because the leaves eventually started to look horrible, I was planning on just pulling the plants. But when I dug around to see if there were any sweet potatoes growing, I did find some, but they were still tiny. They looked healthy and promising though, so I ended up leaving them be. I may check in on it again soon to see how much more it grew. Also, there are several points where the vines are pushing healthy new leaf growth again, so that's a good sign. Our persimmon tree has a lot of fruit this year and they got a little battered under the 100 plus degree heat, but for the most part, look pretty good. I'm personally not a fan, but I know my parents are looking forward to harvesting these. After several different experiments with our jujube tree, I am happy to report that we have an abundant supply of fruits coming in this year. I have made sure to maintain high water and high fertilizer and now I know that that's the recipe for success. Some of them can probably be picked soon because they started to change color a bit. My mom usually says the more brown they are, the sweeter they'll be. This is a fun impromptu project. I'm growing some Kyoho grape seeds. The grapes may not be true to parent, but I decided to give them a go anyways. I noticed some growth a few days ago, but I'm waiting for it to get a little bigger so I can confirm if they're grape seedlings or not. Here's another one of those surprise mystery plants that just pop up randomly. I think it's a pepper, but again, we'll see. Sadly, the super steak tomatoes didn't make it but the rest of them have managed to hang on. I've noticed a few flowers, so we'll see if any of them develop into fruit. These clips may look similar, but if you look closely, there's more and more green growth as time goes on. They looked a lot more unhealthy before I moved them to this side of the backyard, but recently they've looked much more promising. I used to hate tomatoes when I was younger, but they've become an ingredient that I love to add to different dishes I eat. So hopefully I can harvest some homegrown ones. I also lost my original honeycomb cherry tomato plant, so I have a few seedlings growing again. This here is the loofah plant I mentioned earlier. I'm not sure what type of loofah it is, but it's the first time that it has grown this much for me. I moved it in here after removing all the cucumbers, like I said previously. So far, I only have one fruit, which I plan to let dry so that I can make exfoliating soap bars. I'm hoping to get a few more, so keep this little guy in your thoughts. It's a special plant because my mom got a dried loofah from someone who is no longer with us. They had removed all the seeds before giving it to her, but there happened to be one little seed left in the back, so I took that and grew it. 
I wasn't sure if it would go well because that person had given us a seedling before and it didn't make it. But thankfully, this one ended up growing wonderfully. Unfortunately, the person passed before we got the chance to show them this plant, so I think about them whenever I'm out there caring for it. And last, but certainly not least, our dragon fruit jungle. There are two different types of dragon fruit all jumbled together in here. One is pink on the outside and pink on the inside. The other is pink on the outside and white on the inside. I have a third type as well growing separately, which is yellow on the outside and white on the inside. Eventually, I'll be trying to overhaul this dragon fruit setup so that the three types are growing together but separated properly so that we know what the fruit will be instead of waiting until it ripens like we're doing right now. This year, we had about 10 or so flowers and I pollinated them all in the same manner as I show you here. I don't know what the best method is, but this has worked for the past few years, so it's just what I continue to do. Unfortunately, only three were successful and on their way to becoming ripe fruit. If you didn't know, dragon fruit flowers bloom at night and stay open only until about mid-morning. I typically wake up early to go out and pollinate the flowers. The varieties we have are self-pollinating as has been proven in the past. I'm still learning and experimenting with these plants and I'm excited to see which type of fruit we have this year. Two years ago, we had mostly pink and pink with a few pink and white. Last year, we only had the pink and pink fruit. Hopefully, we'll have at least one of each this year so that I can start to separate the plants, but we'll see. I hope you enjoyed all the updates and I'd love to know what you've been able to harvest so far. Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. As we come in for a landing, Carnia and I